Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Teaching Points Recap VMR, which is held every first Tuesday of the month. I am Ombesh Dino, um, a proud member of the CP Solvers Academy and an international medical graduate from Pakistan. It's lovely to have all of you here. Um, and I have three very special guests, my um, uh, colleagues from the CP Solvers Academy. We have Jiajang Shing, we have Noah Romero Nakajima, and we have attending jazz, popularly known as, attending jazz, actually, Jesse Bajwa, popularly known as attending jazz. And I'm going to have all you three amazing people introduce yourselves. Go ahead, Jia. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jia from China, and actually today is my first time to do the Teaching Points Recap, and I'm very excited to uh, share what I learned with you guys. And uh, uh, I'm currently located in Pittsburgh during the internal medicine uh, application season, and out of the uh, medicine, I enjoy like uh, outdoor activities like hiking and uh, uh, practicing yoga. I'm also a big fan of ice cream. Awesome. Love that. Noah. Hey, everyone. My name is Noah. I'm a medical student zooming in from Brazil. I'm super excited to be here. And outside of medicine, my pick for this week is a book that Youssef recommended me. It's called Hidden Potential. Very good book. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Noah. Attending jazz. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jazz. I'm a hospitalist at Rochester, New York. I'm also uh, part of the VMR leadership team, which has been such an honor um, and uh, excited to be part of this great initiative of the recap series. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And all of those in the audience, the chat is your playground. Please feel free to share your thoughts, interact with each other. Thank you for those of you who have your cameras on. I feel like it makes the session all, all the more fun and interactive. And I would love to know those of you, you know, who have joined, who are you and where are you tuning in from? And we're going to get started. But before we do, I, I would just like to uh, give a quick recap of what the Teaching Points Recap VMR is. So this is, uh, as the name suggests, this is a recap. And what we end up doing is we have three of our academy members who pick out three very interesting and very unique cases from the previous month and they this is like a space repetition a great way to you know go over and reflect on some of the very interesting uh, pathologies that we come across uh, through the CP solvers morning report so we're gonna have Gia go first and let's delve right in Gia okay so let me share my screen all right uh, so today the first uh, uh, teaching points recap I'm going to do is based on the uh, VMR, the case shared by Dr. Mark and discussed by Dr. Ravi, Yasmin, and Abraham. Uh, and very interesting, uh, we have two diagnoses for this ca case. So let's do a very quick review about uh, what is that case about. Uh, so in that case, we had a 73-year-old male with leukemia, uh, received chemotherapy and allogenic stem cell transplantation on prophylactic treatment. And after three weeks of this transplantation, uh, the patient presented with dyspnea, hypoxemia, fever, and rash. And uh, during hospitalization, he de developed uh, AKI hemolysis with the schistocyte and the thrombocytopenia. And finally, there are two diagnoses for him. One is the para-engraftment respiratory distress syndrome, PERTS, and another is tacrolimus-induced TMA. So the first topic I'm going to talk with you guys is about the pulmonary complications of uh, stem cell transplantation. So when we think about the complications uh, for a patient who received stem cell transplantation, there are three very important key informations we need to know. The first information is uh, what kind of uh, transplantation the patient received. So basically, there are two types of uh, transplantation. Uh, one is allogenic and another is autogenic. It is very easy to understand from the name. So for the autogenic, the patient just received a stem cell from themselves. And then for the allogenic, uh, the stem cells are actually from another person. Uh, so in autogenic, 
because you can imagine the stem cells are from the patients themselves. So there is no risk of graft versus host disease, GVHD, and no uh, requ requirement of any impressions therapy. And uh, therefore, their immunity can recover at a uh, more quickly uh, speed. And so the time window for the opportunistic infection is shorter. However, there is also uh, a disadvantages. When we try to collect the stem cells from patients, uh, there is a risk that we also uh, collect the cancer cells, so which increase uh, a relapse of a cancer. And uh, I have a question for you guys, and you can just put the yes or no into the chat box. If there is no cancer cell contaminations uh, in autogenic transplantation, uh, do you think the patients also have a like high risk of relapse of cancer? of the leukemia yeah all right so yeah so the uh answer is yes because in allergenic there uh apart from gvhd effect there is also a graft versus cancer effect means the uh, immune cells from another person can uh, function against any cancer cells remaining in the patients. However, uh, in autogenic, there is no, no such effect. Uh, so another very important information we need to know is the time cost, which means how many days after the transplantation uh, the patients uh, have developed the symptoms. Here we have a very important uh, uh, conception we need to know is the uh, engraftment, which means the stem cell transplanted gradually settle down in the bone marrow, and then they begin to grow and generate new blood cells. And uh, uh, from the labs, it is uh, uh, remarkable by the recovery of nutrient cells. So according to the engraftment, there are mainly three phases. Uh, phase one is just days or weeks after the transplantation. During that time, patients usually have a ser uh, very dominant neutropenia, and the acute GVHD also happened during the phase one. And then uh, after weeks and two months after the transplantation, uh, we have the immediate post-engraftment uh, phase, which is phase two, uh, due to the effect of immune suppressant therapy, uh, patients really have impaired cellular immunity and acute GVHD also happened during the phase two. And then in a later phase, phase three, both the cellular and humoral immunity were suppressed by the immune suppressive therapy and uh, chronic GVHD can also happen during uh, phase three. And uh, uh, I have a, a, another question for you guys. So uh, can you think about in terms of this different uh, part of uh, immunity impaired in patients for pyrogenic bacteria, fungi, virals, and encapsulated bacterial infections, uh, in which of these three phases they are more likely to appear? Uh, and actually, we have a very uh, great tables from a journal article, and I uh, kind of adapted it uh, here. Uh, so we can see there are three different phases. And uh, when considering complications after stem cell transplantation, uh, we have to think whether the whole picture fits more into infectious etiology or non-infectious etiology. And uh, so come back to the question before, we can see in phase one, because the patients have dominant neutropenia, uh, they are more like, so they are more likely to uh, infect it with uh, pyrogenic bacteria, uh, angioinvasive fungi and candida. And then at a later stage, because their cellular immunity will be impa uh, impaired, uh, so the virus infection are more likely to happen during phase two and phase three. And in a later phase, because their cellular, uh, their humoral uh, immunity uh, is defected, so they are more likely to have encapsulated bacterial infection. And uh, uh, for the uh, for non uh, infectious etiology, we can consider from these two perspectives. The one is immune uh, factors and another is cancer. So during phase two, 
because at that time the patients their blood cells haven't recovered uh, covered yet so they usually receive a lot of blood transfusion which can lead to some pulmonary complications and the pers also happen during the phase two and uh, uh, and uh, some pulmonary conditions like vod dah uh, their mechanism kind of release uh, related with uh, uh, cytokine release also uh, and therefore uh, they happen in uh, an early early phase and uh, at a late phase because of the effect of uh, different medications and the effect of uh, the uh, immune uh, uh, immune awake uh, GVD, GVHD uh, so some specific pulmonary conditions like BO and organizing new, pneumonia can happen at a later stage and also due to the effect of immune suppressants uh, some cons specific cancer related to transplantation like PTLD can also happen at a later phase uh, so talking about uh, PERTS, what is PERTS? Uh, this is actually my first time to learn this new, new term. And the, uh, the PERTS is, means uh, a pulmonary manifestation related to engraftment syndrome. And engraftment syndrome is actually a bucket of a lot of uh, symptoms that uh, just happen around the time of neutrophil engraftment. The, uh, its mechanism is related to the cytokine release uh, during the engraftment uh, uh, stages. And uh, from this picture, we can see uh, there are a lot of symptoms that can happen during the engraftment uh, uh, syndrome, like uh, fever, skin rash, diarrhea, some abnormal findings in labs, uh, pulmonary manifestations, and even worse, in some cases, encephalopathies. And actually, uh, the engraftment syndrome, uh, initially I feel it is uh, sounds very likely to acute GVHD to me, like all these symptoms, even the mechanisms. However, it is there are two different ideas. The engraftment syndrome can happen in both types of stem cell transplantation, and also it has a specific time requirement during the engraft, engraftment time. So here we have a diagnose criteria for PERTS. Uh, first, in order to uh, diagnose PERS, we need uh, the uh, clinical symptoms of pneumonia, like cough, dyspnea, and also uh, hypoxemia, uh, new demand of uh, oxygen. And at the same time, there is uh, we need uh, imaging, imaging evidence, uh, like pulmonary infiltration, opacities, and the time need to be occurring around the engraftment uh, time. And also, we have to rule out any infectious etiology or pulmonary edema caused by heart or renal conditions. For the management, it is very important to use high dose of steroids. And uh, patients can re usually respond very quickly, like just in days. And because the patients also have another diagnosis, tacrolimus induced TMA, I really want to uh, show something about uh, this topic, Mahan TMA. And actually, we have two TMA cases in November. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm here just uh, uh, sharing what I learned from our academic VMR by Dr. Robbie. And uh, so for Maha, this term, it refers to a pathologic process, which means the red blood cell fragmented in the patient's vessels and uh, generate schistocytes. And for TMA, it is a name of a clinical syndrome. It uh, uh, includes hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and organ uh, damage due to thrombosis. And uh, so here are two points I learned. First, not all the maha are caused by a TMA. Uh, the uh, intravascular non-immune hemolysis can also cause by vessel spasm, caused by valve conditions. And the second point is not all TMA will present with uh, maha or some thrombocytopenia. There are a lot of subtypes of uh, TMA, and uh, they have a different uh, uh, like picture of which symptoms they are dominant. 
And so here, I uh, first want to give a shout to Dr. Andrew to allow me to use his schema in my slide. And you can follow up his Twitter. He usually shares a lot of uh, info informative and educational schema like this. So in this picture, we can see uh, there are mainly two types of TMA, primary and uh, secondary. The one thing I want to uh, uh, like uh, address, uh, especially towards this case, is uh, uh, when we take care of uh, patients with cancer, we need to consider several things. The first is the drug, the medications they received, because we can see a lot of chemotherapy agents, a lot of solid tumor uh, agents like VEGF inhibitors, they can induce TMA. And uh, in this case, the immune suppressants Tacrolimus induce the TMA. And uh, don't forget the uh, tumor itself, especially solid tumor like prostate cancer, can induce cancer TMA. And actually, cancer TMA usually have a bad prognosis. And the bone marrow transplantation can all, all, also induce TMA. And so here are my take home points. Uh, first, uh, when considering uh, complications of stem cell transplantation, important to know three things. The time, the type of stem cell transplantation, and uh, the whole picture of the illness, whether it is uh, it more fit the infectious etiology or non-infectious etiology. And the second point is about PERS. So PERS is a pulmonary uh, manifestation of engraftment syndrome. Therefore, it can happen with other uh, symptoms of the EAs, like fever and rash in our case. And the last point is about MAHA and TMA. So MAHA is a pathological process, and TMA is the name of a clinical syndrome. So we could not like uh, conclude one based on another one. So here is some resources I used to prepare this presentation, and you can look it up if you are interested in, uh, to these two topics. And uh, uh, also thanks again to Dr. Rabin, Dr. Ma Mark, and Dr. Andrew for these ideas they uh, shared with me. And also a big shout to Ambish to help me with my uh, first recap uh, recap presentation. Thank you. And you, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. Yeah. I will stop my share and pass the mic, uh, mic to, uh, to Ambish. Thank you, Gia. That was an excellent presentation. You can see in the chat, everyone's a fan. And you did not teach us one or two, but you taught us four very, uh, you know, important entities. And, uh, you know, the way you broke down such intricate details and created those, you know, flowcharts and everything. I know the amount of hard work that you put in. I really appreciate it. And I think you're an excellent teacher. And by the way, your slide six, I think everybody fell in love with that and they even screenshotted it. So great work and thank you so much for putting in the effort and time to teach us. And next up we have Noah. Noah, the stage is yours. Hey y'all, so my name is Noah. Today I'm gonna be recapping the VMR of 18th of November was presented by the Cleveland Clinic uh, Foundation Internal Medicine Program, and it was discussed by me, Hui Ting, Yusuf, and Austin. So today my point is going to be that understanding the exact meaning of words in medicine gives you clarity where the points of tension are, okay? So let's think of, of an architect, architect, right? He can study the floor plan, the schemas that they use to build houses, much like we use schemas to study clinical reasoning. But if we don't have a good understanding of the little bricks that go into building a house or the little concepts that go into building the clinical reasoning, it's going to be faulty and the house, the house is going to fall down, right? So today is going to be an invitation of a different way of reflecting about clinical reasoning, brick by brick. So today we will briefly jog your memory about the case and go through two learning journeys that I went through. And by doing this, I'll prove that understanding the exact meaning of words gives you clarity where exactly the points of tension are in your clinical reasoning. 
So firstly, a young man with too many problems, 35 year old presenting with all those problems, anasarca, weight loss, fatigue, dyspnea, some voice changes, something was going on in his neck, bilateral knee pain, prostatitis. And we went along in the case and the problem representation was updated. So it was a 35 year old man presenting with a chronic infiltrative disease and the nephrotic nephritic syndrome, also with Graves, and some kind of pulmonary involvement represented by the dyspnea. And the kidney biopsy clinched the diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. I highly recommend you guys watching the full VMR because I could not do it justice in 10 to 12 minutes. So the road to this diagnosis wasn't, you know, very straightforward. It was a very bumpy road at times. The first, um, you know, pothole that we faced was in the initial labs. It showed eosinophilia, and eosinophilia is kind of an unusual presentation, right? It, got, it caught us by, by surprise. And I was thinking, what is eosinophilia? You know, what is hyper eosinophilia? What are hyper eosinophilic syndromes? And what is the driver of eosinophilia? And that's what I'm going to tackle today with you all. So eosinophilia is very complex. So for some definitions, peripheral eosinophilia is more than 500 cells. So we don't use the relative count for eosinophilia. We use the absolute eosinophil counts, okay? More than 500 eosinophilia. If you have more than 1500, you have hyper eosinophilia, but you also have to have tissue hyper eosinophilia. So let's say you have a patient with more than 1500 cells you do an endoscopy because he has some GI symptoms. You take a biopsy of his esophagus and you see tissue hyper eosinophilia in uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Then you have a hyper eosinophilia. What about the hyper eosinophilic syndrome? It's only the hyper eosinophilia, but the end organ damage caused by this hyper eosinophilia. Okay? And this eosinophilia is categorized based on the driver. So it can either be primary or neoplastic. So basically your bone marrow is producing too much monoclonal eosinophils and that's driving the eosinophilia. Or it can either be reactive from stimuli that's called secondary. And it's going to be a polyclonal uh, eosinophils in the blood. And also uh, idiopathic. So who knows what's driving this, uh, this finding. The DDX for secondary or reactive eosinophilic is very extensive, right? We can all think of many, many causes that drive eosinophilia. So allergic uh, disorders, infections, uh, especially parasites, neoplasms. So solid tumors can produce IL-5, which drives up the produ production of eosinophils. Immune disorders, so flashback to step studies, hyper IgE syndrome, or maybe some autoimmune disease, just like IgG4 related disease. You have eosinophilic disorders proper, like uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, and you also have like different causes, adrenal insufficiency, radiation exposure, so very extensive. With that in mind, our patient had mild eosinophilia, is around 600, likely reactive to an unknown driver. So we know that this eosinophilia is very mild, it's probably secondary because it's kind of low, and this should guide us in answering this question. Should this reactive eosinophilia go to the foreground and we base our DDX on that? Or should we just put a pin on it and go to the background? And I want you all to reflect and think of the answer. And, you know, we continued on with the case and we hit another pothole in our way. Somewhere along the way, we got an SPEP and serum free light chain levels. So the SPEP showed hypergammaglobulinemia, no M spike. The serum free light chain showed an elevated kappa to lambda ratio. And the Ig level showed elevated IgG, normal IgM, <laughs> and normal IgA. And what did the globulins mean? Like I was, I was just like this internally when I was hearing all this information. Because like we only hear about the SPEP in the context of 
multiple myeloma, a mo monoclonal gamma gammopathy, and we're kind of biased in our thinking. So let's break it down, okay? So we have hyper gamma globulinemia. Hyper is too much. Gamma is gamma, globulins is globulins. Uh, EMEA is in the blood, okay? So globulins are actually proteins with a globular shape, except albumin. And they are divided into alpha, beta, and gamma. And most antibodies fall into the gamma cat category. So basically, hypergamma globulinemia means that you have too much antibodies. That's it. This is the ideal antibody. You may not look like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. So we have two heavy chains and one light chain here and one light chain here. So those light chains, they can also be kappa or lambda. Keep that in mind for you know, future slides. And this is what it looks like, like in real life. What about the SPEP? The SPEP is a marble race for proteins. So basically you, uh, do a you put a current in the proteins and they are categorized based on the size and the charge that they have. Okay, so we have albumin here, and then we have alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and gamma. And most antibodies will fall here. So let's say you have two twins. You have a pair of twins. They are exactly the same. They run at the same speed. If you put them to race against one another, they'll end up the race like in very similar positions. And that's basically what happens in the M spike. You have monoclonal, so twins, and they all fall together in the same place. And that's what causes this spike. So this is indicative of monoclonal gammopathy, like multiple myeloma and others. But there is an important caveat. Usually this is indicative of monoclonal uh, gammopathy because uh, as people have found out, IgG4 can mimic this pattern. Even though this case didn't mimic, uh, IgG4 can present as an M spike in the SPEP. So let's talk about the serum free light chains. We saw an elevated kappa lambda ratio, which is not pathognomonic of monoclonality, as I found out. You know, in my head, I, was, I always was taught to think elevated kappa, kappa lambda equals multiple myeloma, monoclonal gammopathy, but no. Immunoglobulins have light chains, and those can either be kappa, kappa or lambda, as I said before. A cell will secrete some with kappa, some with lambda, following a specific uh, pattern. Usually, this results in a stable ratio, but if you have any form of increased production, like any autoimmune disease, Shrogan's IgG4, even lupus, or decreased clearance of those light chains, by the kidney, so in chronic kidney disease, this can mess up the ratio big time. So many, many diseases can present with an elevated kappa lambda ratio. So it's not pathognomonic of monoclonal gammopathy. So what do the globulins mean? Uh, it just means that our patient has too much antibodies in his body or the antibody production is turned up. He has an autoimmune disorder. And the absence of M spike goes against, uh, goes with polyclonality, polyclonality, and it's probably due to the IgG, as we saw, the IgG levels were elevated. So the medical teaching points for my presentation is that our patient had mild reactive eosinophilia, because the the DDX is so extensive and the eosinophilia was so mild, it goes to the background of our clinical reason we shouldn't put too much emphasis on it. Our patient also had too much antibodies from polyclonal activation. And if you think about it, this is so unspecific, right? He could have an infection, he could have basically any autoimmune disorder. And this also goes to the background because it just means he's inflamed. I didn't know about this. And during the discussion, I placed too much emphasis in this elevated kappa lambda ratio. And as we know, now know, elevated ratio is not equal to monoclonal gammopathy. So as I said before, understanding what the bricks, what the words really mean, and those fundamental concepts is key to building a sound uh, clinical reasoning. So not, don't focus only on the schemas and the frameworks, focus on the definitions, just like Gia just mentioned, TMA versus Maha, and now I'm mentioning like what 
exactly elevated kappa lambda ratio means, what exactly hypergamma globulinemia means, is knowing the bricks that we can build a, a solid foundation for our house. And I've got homework for you all. I invite you to take uh, to do this reflection, just like I did, and answer the following questions. So what is the definition of nephrotic syndrome? What is the definition of nephritic syndrome? What does HB3 plus mean on the UA? So this was a finding that also tripped us up during uh, the discussion of this case. What does that mean? And a final question. Is hemoglobinuria the same as hematuria? And those are my references. Thank you all. Whoa, Noah, that was amazing. I just have to say, Noah, that was whoa. <laughs> Loved it. It was captivating. It was informative. And I think an, a teacher, you know, is a good teacher is good at breaking things down right? Captivating your attention, keeping you focused throughout. And you did that. We were all mesmerized by the images that you had created. And while you were presenting, I was actually walking along the journey that you were taking when you were making this presentation. All the thoughts that were in your head, the way you were connecting the art, art and science together. It was amazing to watch. Thank you for that. We have saved the best for the last, attending jazz in the house, the state is yours. Uh, disagree with that statement. Uh, I finally know what it feels like to have a bronze medal because that I there's nothing. I'm not I'm not being humble here. That both presentations from both of you were amazing. Uh, I'm gonna chalk this up to old age. Uh, I'm not spring as these young bucks, so my presentation does not have anything uh, very fancy or pretty. It's dull <laughs> um and uh i hope my um lecturing style is enough for to for you guys to take away certain things um okay so i had the the tall task uh, of recapping such a complex but such an educational case that was done on november 24th um of this year um the case presenter was the one and only promise lee and the discussants were um, Robbie Loves Reza or Reza Loves Robbie. Uh, I would sing for you the song, but I, I don't want to scare away half the audience. Um, so this case, before I begin the recap, I, I think talking about the final diagnosis is too complex. Um, I think it's a, such a rare diagnosis. There were so many other great learning points that came out of that, present, that uh, discussion that I feel like is going to be the biggest bang for everyone's bucks here. We're going to definitely see a lot of those things. And then we'll definitely compare and contrast the two differentials that the, that the uh, discussants were going back and forth. And I, I tried to illustrate why that was so painful to select one over the other. So that's my goal for today. Um, so let's begin. Uh, so case presentation. So this was a 27-year-old male that was recently diagnosed with HIV and that now is presenting with diffuse lymphadenopathy with possible seizure, transfusion resistant by cytopenia, Coombs positive hemolytic anemia, and rapid multi organ failure in the context of iris multifocal Kaposi sarcoma. Just the problem representation should tell you how complex this case was. That is a very complex case. And uh, uh, sorry, problem representation that you can have like at least six different learning points coming out from here. But I was told to limit this to fifteen to ten minutes, so I'm going to try to think. I'm going to try to focus on the on the things that I think, for me at least, were the biggest takeaways. And I listed them there for you: Coombs positive hemolytic anemia, and in this case, there was a disconnect between the hemoglobin that the patient presented with and this finding of a Coombs positive hemolytic anemia. The second, the positivity for HHV8, in my opinion, was very important in this case, because the two differentials that were being um, kind of talked back and forth ha had this association with it, HHV8. And then the diffuse extensive ly lymphadenopathy and hepatospinal megaly, when you see, when you hear those words, there should be a few things that should be in your brain automatically. So those are the key points I wanna highlight and let's begin. So let's 
before we go into the deep dive of Coombs positive hemolytic anemia, let's take a step back and let's try to break down hemolysis in a very sim simplematic, easily digestible way. One, you want to break it down into cell lysis. So this, I want you guys to view as acute, messy, sloppy, all the cells are just kind of just getting destroyed. That will have more of a lab evidence. You're going to have increased LDH. You're going to have increased AST. You're going to have increased potassium and increased, increased phosphorus. Why? Every single one of those markers are found inside the red blood cell. Whereas the other bucket is RBC specific markers. I want you guys to think of this as like your, you know, those snipers that are just targeting specific individuals or specific RBC cells, and it's not creating this massive over uh, spill of things. In that case, you're not, you may not see that lab evidence as obvious as the other ones. You may see an increased reticular site count. You may see an indirect ability. I want you guys to think about things like sickle cell or proxenal noct nocturnal hemoglobinuria or G6PD deficiency. As you can see, all of these factors are more subacute onset and they're not as in your face like, oh my God, this patient is definitely hemolyzing. So that's how, I, and this is a schema from the, the, the Clinical Problem Solver website, which I think just so beautifully simplistic, but also packed with so much information. So now let's talk about the autoimmune hemolytic anemia schema, also found on the website. We break it down, we have warm versus cold. Warm, way more common, cold, less common. What is cold associated with? IgM, warm is associated with an IgG. How do they present? That's different too. Warm, faster, acute, mostly extravascular. The DAT would be positive for IgG. And if you get a smear, you'll see more spherocytes on, on the actual smear. Where on the cold side, you have chronic or subacute even, and you'll see um, a smear showing a Rulex formation, not the wash, that's Rolex. And you'll also see the spherocytes. You can see spherocytes, but they're less common. The Rulex formation actually happens in this case because the when we say cold uh, autoimmune hemolytic it is actually temperature dependent, um, especially in the case of like the mycoplasma pneumonia. You are so it is at a cold. So these Rulex formations tend to form. It can can happen in a colder temperature or a cold, uh, 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 whether it's body temperature or when they do it in testing in the lab. So in terms of etiology, they're both idiopathic 50% of the time. So meaning we couldn't find a trigger that led to this uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Second, both of them are uh, can be associated with lupus. Then the differences happen. The warm is more associated with um, lymphomas, CLL, marginal cell lymphoma, and some other lymphomas as well. And this also can be associated with CVID, and then it's also can be associated with Babesia and drug reactions. Whereas cold, okay, it's more associated with the mycoplasma. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we've all learned this in med school, where basically uh, we, you know, we see mycoplasma pneumonia infection. A couple of weeks later, the patient is anemic, and we go back in history and say, huh, maybe they had a walking pneumonia, and now they're having hemolytic anemia from that. And then malignancies is mostly solid malignancies are associated with cold um, autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia, specifically breast and renal cell. However, any solid malignancy can lead to this. And the mechanism is actually a perineoplastic syndrome. And from those two I mentioned, renal cell and then also per, um, breast are notorious for creating uh, perineoplastic syndromes. So now let's, let's tie this into the case that we just saw. The hemoglobin for this patient was 3.3. The LDH was not that impressive. This patient, if you looked at this, if you heard this patient's case, this patient was clinically very, very ill. The LDH was like in the 300s. That didn't, that didn't really make sense. On top of that, half the globin was normal. So this was a disconnect. It was a disconnect to the point where Robbie pointed out that they, he, did, he was not convinced that the autoimmune hemolytic anemia was the prime culprit. And he very astutely said that I think this is, sure, there might be some component of hemolytic anemia, but I honestly think that this is a, a, a malignancy that's confounding the profound anemia, especially considering that it was, it was treatment resistant, it kept going down. 
because usually I don't, if you give someone transfusion, you know, there is a possibility that they will start slowly, you know, uh, hemolyzing again after the transfusion, but the way that this patient was still so sick made it underlying a very aggressive cancer that wasn't being treated. And then they also find out in, th in this particular patient, what malignancies were they most concerned for? They mentioned three, lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, and then Castleman's. So let's talk about that next. So this is where both Robbie and Reza were kind of just going back and forth of like iris Kaposi sarcoma versus Castleman's. Now I'm gonna take a step back and define all of those things first, because if you're like me, these are rare things that I did not know about uh, even before this case, or even I'm still not clear about it even after the case. It's so it's, it's such a complex uh, diagnosis. Let's first talk about iris. What does this stand for? Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Now, surprisingly, it, um, so actually before I go into that, I like to use analogies to teach me things that are very hard to, to digest. So I want you all to close your eyes and I want you to think that you are a superhero. So I want you to picture that you being the superhero is the art therapy, so antiretroviral therapy. And the villains that you're fighting off is the HIV infection, okay? So you kill the, uh, the, the villains and you get, you get rid of them. But the city that you're fighting uh, the villains in they're gonna to have to clean up the mess that you've created by getting the villains out of the way. And that's like your fire fire uh, uh, department, your police officers. I want you to view that as your immune system. As they come in and they start cleaning up, they may not do a, a very targeted job of cleaning up. They may just clean up even like the civilians or things that should not have been attacked. And that is how iris can be very, could be, you know, make simplified of what iris is. Specifically, if you wanted to get into the scientifics, it's an attack against an antigen. And I'll explain later what, why I said antigen and not something else. Other thing that's important is in iris, about 25 to 30% of patients who have HIV that get started on an art therapy can get iris. That's a pretty profound number uh, of patients. What is Kaposi sarcoma? Kaposi sarcoma is a soft tissue malignancy that is associated with AIDS and HHV8. Now this iris Kaposi sarcoma syndrome is very rare, very, very rare. And honest, if I'm being completely transparent, I don't have enough knowledge about it to give you the details of who, how many people it affects, how common it is, but I want you to, and I'm gonna give you all homework. I want you to actually look it up and, and, and kind of think about you know, how common is it? Why does it happen? And, you know, what is the clinical presentation? Now, the other thing I'm gonna quickly share is the Kaposi sarcoma usually has mucocutaneous manifestations. And those range from your pink, purple, blue discoloration, and sometimes even just macules that are brownish in color. And I, why did I mention that? Because it does actually show up in this case, uh, potentially, I may explain uh, what was going on in this patient. Now, let me quickly go over Castleman's. When you think of Castleman's, I want you to think of two types of Castleman's, unicentric and multicentric. Unicentric, how do you differentiate between unicentric and multicentric? Unicentric is usually involving just one lymph node, most of the time. However, you can have a cervical chain, oh, sorry, a lymph node chain, like for example, the, the cervical lymph nodes, or let's say the axillary lymph nodes that can get, get affected, but usually that's it. If you see axillary and cervical, that is not unicentric castle. Now there's a misnomer that, that was going around there that saying the unicentric uh, castle doesn't present with fevers. That is not true, it can. In fact, I saw a case in residency where it was unicentric castle and the patient was having recent periodic fevers. But the main differentiating factor that was why it was unicentric and not multicentric is that she was um, only involved in the cervical lymph nodes. So that is the main takeaway. Whereas multicentric, you can have diffuse lymphadenopathy. You can have um, swollen um, organs in unicentric 
um, uh, like a paddle spinal magnet, but it's less common compared to multicenter. So I hope that overview of painting the picture of unicentric versus multicentric castlements and the iris, breaking down what iris is, and then breaking down iris pacuzzi sarcoma can kind of paint you know, the rough picture of what the patient can present like. But I can also, gonna, I'm also gonna share a visual. So in this patient, so what you see in this table is basically what criteria made Robbie and Reza feel like this is more iris kaposi sarcoma, or why is this maybe more multicentric castlements? So let's start off with the multicentric castlement side first. The diffuse lymphadenopathy, that's a point towards multicentric castlements. No mucosal lesions. Now I put a question mark beside that. The reason why I put a question mark beside that is after the case concluded, Robbie said that there's a good chance, a 50% chance that this patient probably had some oral mucosal cutaneal lesion that probably got missed or just wasn't able to be found. And he really highlighted the point of a very good oral mucosal exam to make sure you don't miss even the smallest clue that could have uh, swung the pendulum. Kidney injury out of proportion to the uric acid level. So the uric acid level wasn't that impressive, but the kidney injury, this patient was basically in profound renal failure. That disconnect, Robbie taught us that is more in line with multicentric castlements. The HHV8 HIV is associated with is is associated with multicentric castlements, but if you look to the left, it's also associated with Kaposi sarcoma. But you can you're more likely to see multicentric castlements without the association of HHH, HHV8 and HIV than you are with Kaposi sarcoma. Um, with, uh, with, uh, with HHV8, HIV. So what I'm trying to, to simplify that, you're more likely to see multicentric castlements by itself with no association with viruses, but it's very, very rare to have, in fact, almost impossible, someone said, correct me on that, but to have Kaposi, iris Kaposi sarcoma, well, iris definitely, but Kaposi sarcoma without association with HHV8 and HIV. And then the hepatosplenomegaly was present in both. Now let's quickly look over iris and Kaposi. The lymphadenopathy, yes, that's both there, the HHV8 and the and the megaly. Recent art therapy, that's a huge pendulum towards iris Kaposi. Sir. And the last one I added, because lack of fever. Yeah, yeah. This patient did not have a fever, at least not a profound one or not a recurrent fever. That would have really swung the pendulum towards multicentric castles. And, and I'll share this in my next slide. Um, but... Uh, or the two slides from now, but that is a really key point um, because you need uh, multicentric castlements almost 100% of the time has a fever. So that could have been a clue that, that this might be iris Kaposi sarcoma. But as you can see, the criteria here, you had equal criteria for both sides, which made the, probably the brightest diagnosticians on this planet struggle between these two entities. But this is the point where a teaching point from here is, do all of these risk factors have the same weight? And for that, I would say no, because the lack of fever, in my opinion, really makes multicentric castlements to at least pause and say, are we missing something else? So for the hemolysis, when thinking about hemolytic anemia, think about two large buckets, cell lysis and your RBC specific markers. When it comes to the autoimmune hemolytic anemia, think about warm versus cold, so IgG versus IgM. And then when, it, when you're thinking about warm, think about more acute, smear will show spherocytes and 50% is idiopathic. If you're associated with um, other medical conditions, you wanna make sure you rule out lymphomas, lupus, CBID, babesia, and drugs. When it comes to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, subacute to chronic presentation, Smear will show Rulux formation, and about 50% is idiopathic. IgM, MGUS is an association with this, mycoplasma, lupus, and solid malignancies, specifically breast and renal cell. So why does iris happen? Art therapy, superheroes, kill off the HIV, bad guys. CD4, so the underlying police and fire department come and they start to recover and they start taking over the city and cleaning up all the mess. That is the immune response responding to the antigen. And this is where Reza really highlighted this point. 
Reza said that antigens it is antigen specific because it's not just the infection. It could be also to cancers. So that was the main pearl that was taken out of that. So when specifically highlighting the Kapusi um, sarcoma iris diagnosis should be considered if a clinical abrupt worsening of a previously existing Kapusi sarcoma, that's called paradoxal KS iris, or you can have Kapusi iris in the development of, a, uh, of KS that wasn't there before, so that's unmasked. And it has to happen within the first six months of initiation of ART. And in, for statistics, unmasking KS iris is more common than paradoxical. Fevers are present almost 100% of the time in multicentric Casanova's disease, especially if the patient has HHV8 uh, and, slash HIV uh, and is presenting with multicentric Casanova's. Skin exams in patients with HIV, extremely important. You cannot take sacrifices or shortcuts when it comes to doing skin exams because um, you, there might be even the smallest thing that could play a clue of what's going on. And more emphasis on the oral exam, oral exam. This patient did have some hypopigmented macules on the shins. Could this have been a clue? Um, because my illness script for Kaposi sarcoma is like your purple, red, you know, nodular um, mucocutaneous manifestation. However, during my research and preparing this, it showed that you can have brown or even sometimes lighter, lighter colored um, rash, and it can either be raised like a nodule or flat like a macule. So it's unclear if in this case it was a clue, but any type of new skin eruption, whether it looks as benign as a mole, which by the way, nevi even uh, can also, some Kaposi skin manifestations can present like nevi. Um, it could be a clue that there might be something underlying that might be brewing. Um, Reza shared this point pretty early. I think Robbie did too, that if you have a patient that you're concerned for iris Kaposi sarcoma, um, do not give them IV or oral steroids because they can progress their underlying disease. And last but not least, a primary care pearl, because unfortunately this case ended with a patient mortality um, this case really, really highlighted the importance of PrEP uh, treatment in the outpatient setting for our patients. Um, my reference is much smaller than um, everyone else's, uh, the CP solvers and a couple other review articles that I used. Thank you, attending Jazz. There's a reason why we all call you attending Jazz and it felt like I was your resident or your medical student and you were giving us all a class and your, your teaching skills and your depth of knowledge truly shone through. It was a master class. Thank you for taking the time out and preparing this beautiful you know presentation. And I think um, a teacher is good at um, explaining the concepts and you know, breaking things down and all of you today, I learned so much from you. These cases were so complex. And I absolutely agree with Jazz when he said that, you know, you 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 come across these entities, but you still do not remember them. You still do not learn, which is why we have these teaching point recap VMR. So spaced repetition is something that uh, you know goes comes in handy for all physicians, for all medical students. And this is what we're trying to achieve through this session. Thank you everybody for joining us. We'll be back again next month with, with another Teaching Point Recap VMR. If any of you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. You could email us. Thank you so much for joining us. And this was a perfectly timed session. We have a few more minutes if anybody would like to say anything. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Gia. It was lovely to facilitate this session with all, with all of you three amazing people, amazing teachers. See you soon. Bye, guys.